My contention has always been that that we're still not making room for actual gender non-conforming children, these naturally gender non-conforming children who come out very early. I still don't think we understand them or just provide room for them to be themselves without facilitating them into another category that is often eventually associated with medicalization and also now requires us to... Um, change our understandings and definition of biological sex. We're often now saying like, oh, these really are, you know, this this gender nonconforming female is a boy. And that's pretty new. And it's making us fight over what it means to be male and female and trying to control how people think and talk about this instead of saying, well, there are People disagree in some very fundamental ways about this very basic part of being human, and we're going to have to talk about that. Welcome to the Unspeakable Podcast. I'm your host, Megan Daum. The conversation you're about to hear is the third part of a three-part series I released over the course of one week on the subject of gender transition among children and young people. The first part was with psychologist Dr. Laura Edwards Leeper. In the second part, I brought Dr. Leeper together with two moms of gender dysphoric children who I had originally interviewed several months ago. Those conversations were very much about what happens on the ground when kids ask for medicalized treatment for gender dysphoria. The one you're about to hear with journalist Lisa Selin Davis widens the aperture a bit and looks at the cultural and political forces that have played a role in this issue reaching such prominence and why the media has been so reluctant to cover the whole story. Lisa has written extensively on this subject. She's also the author of a book about the evolution of gender stereotypes over the last few centuries and is herself the mother of a gender nonconforming child. I felt like she was the perfect person to conclude this series. And even if you haven't yet listened to the previous two segments, this interview very much stands on its own and gets into layers that are rarely, if ever, explored. So here is our conversation. Lisa Selen Davis, welcome to the Unspeakable Podcast. Thank you for having me. This is the third installment in a three-part series this week about gender identity and how to think about gender transition in youth. I guess I will start by asking you, as somebody who has written a lot about this, who's thought a lot about it, who reads what other people are writing about it, why is this so hard to get right? Um, I have been absolutely vexed by this subject and how to handle it, um, so much so that for the first time ever, I'm having three conversations in one week uh, (laughs) in an attempt to get it even close to accurate or satisfying. Why is this so hard? Well, I have asked myself that question too. And I think that part of the problem is when when we're looking for the right way to talk about it, that's That's not necessarily what we should be aiming for, at least those of us in the media. And because there is, um, because we're talking about in, in some ways, like the most fundamental aspect of being human, you know, which is that we, we, we have two kinds. I mean, the very first story in the Bible is explaining why we have two kinds and that's how we make more people. So um, we're talking about this fundamental aspect of of being human, and we're also talking about a generation that understands themselves differently, that has historically been pathologized by the medical and mental health communities in ways that they don't agree with, and, um, and wants the chance to be in charge of how they are understood and declaring what's normal. But it doesn't necessarily mean that their way of seeing things is the only way of seeing things. And I think what we've, what we've got to work harder at is plurality and seeing things from multiple perspectives and not when we get new understandings of gender, not just throwing out all of the old ones, but figuring out how we can synthesize these disparate views. And you use the word satisfying. 
maybe we will never be satisfied. But if we get to a point where we can allow dissenting voices to speak, maybe we can at least get a little bit of a clearer picture of what's going on. And when you say dissenting voices, what do you mean? I mean that what I feel we're mostly hearing about in the media are this the story, the, this dominant narrative that a trans kid um, is an, an identifiable kind of person who requires a specific kind of treatment and without questioning that. And that that narrative includes um, manipulating research to have that, to promote that outcome or ignoring research that disrupts that outcome and narrative. And it's a narrative that I think must be true for many, many people. And that's why they're clinging to it so much. But there are also many people (laughs) who want to say, guess what? I was also mistreated by the medical and mental health communities because my transition was facilitated because I wasn't properly evaluated. And there's so much going on. There's so much grooming of of children and there's so much celebrating when you come out. And then if you realize you made a mistake, um, there's so much bullying. Or if you want to dissent or disrupt the narrative, there's so much bullying. But then the people doing the bullying feel very bullied also. And then there are the people like Laura Edwards Leeper and and the people who want to be like her and speak out, many of whom I've talked to, who don't want to lose their jobs. And those are people who are not the transphobes. They're not the ones saying like, this is all bullshit and it's not real. They're the ones saying, oh, this is very much real. And we believe in gender affirming care. And we believe that we're doing the, we can do the right thing and we can do this well. But this narrative that has taken hold that, that we must blindly affirm and not do therapy and that, that any kind of exploration or trying to make someone feel comfortable with themselves is conversion therapy. So therefore you cannot disrupt anything any child says. I mean, that narrative has really prevented most people from speaking out, even if they want to. And and there are some clinicians who would like to speak out, but they feel like they'll lose their job if they do. And they think it's better to remain silent and keep their job rather than be replaced with someone who will not properly assess children. Let's back up a little bit in case there's anybody out there who is kind of just now wading into this subject and this conversation. When somebody, if somebody came to you and said, oh, what's going on with all this gender stuff? Like what, I see it all around me and I'm hearing about this and my kid's school and I'm seeing this in the media. Like, hey, Lisa, you're somebody who looks like you know about this. What's happening? And when did this start? Like, can you just give kind of an overview maybe for the person who doesn't follow every detail of this? Yeah. Well, how can I do that? I mean, when do we go back? When did this... Okay, but also just like, uh, when did this start? Like, maybe just, I don't know how far you okay. back you want to go, but just... Well, first, I want to say that, that there have always been gender nonconforming people, and there have always people that did not fit in their biological category because they did not conform to the norms and expectations, what I think of as gender, um, of their category. And many cultures have dealt with this in different ways. We're often talking now about you know, non-Western cultures that have these categories or, or Native American cultures that have these categories of other genders. Um, this is not true universally, but for the most part, those are, they're usually men, not always, um, but they're usually very feminine gay men that are facilitated into, new, into a new category that brings relief to people and um, makes people understand what they are. And also, Putting them in a new category allows them to just be themselves in places where homosexuality is not allowed or sanctioned or could be actually illegal. But that's not to say that every gender nonconforming person in history is gay. It's just to say that there has always been an overlap that we seem to be denying now and that there have always been people who, who didn't fit in their category. 
And we have had different ways of understanding these people at different times in history. And can you give a few examples, like when in history and is where might this be going on now, for instance? So the the Fafa Fine in Samoa are a category that is long understood. I don't think it doesn't mean that they're not sometimes like marginalized or oppressed, but I think they're... um, pretty much fine. And they're feminine gay men, but they're facilitated into this new category. And from what I've learned and from talking to experts who study them, I have not talked to any Fafafini themselves, but um, that, that many, um, you know, quote unquote, straight men sleep with them. And there's no warring over bathrooms because everyone knows they're androphilic that is attracted to men. And there's no concept of gender identity. There's no concept of being, you know, I'm really a woman. There's no denying of biological sex. There's no gender dysphoria. So in some way, I'm not saying that you couldn't critique this, but in some way there was allowance made for gender nonconformity. It required a new category to do that. Um, And maybe in some ways for some people, non-binary is doing that. But we are also in this country, I mean, people often re- refer to the Fafafine or the Hydra of India. They say they have their genders. They impose our Western concept of gender identity onto them. And, um, and they ignore the connection to sexuality. And I don't know. I mean, my contention has always been that, that we're still not making room for actual gender nonconforming children, these naturally gender nonconforming children who come out very early. Um, I still don't think we understand them or just provide room for them to be themselves without facilitating them into another category that is often eventually associated with medicalization and also now requires us to change our understandings and definition of biological sex. We're often now saying like, oh, these really are, you know, this this gender nonconforming female is a boy. And that's pretty new. And it's making us fight over what it means to be male and female and trying to control how, you know, that how people think and talk about this instead of saying, well, there are people disagree in some very fundamental ways about this very basic part of being human. And we're going to have to talk about that, but we're not allowed to talk about it. When you say pretty new, what are you talking about? Well, the term gender identity is from, and I may get this wrong, but I think it's from 1964 when a psychologist and sexologist named John Money opened the gender identity clinic at Johns Hopkins um, which was eventually closed when um, when it was found that that the people who who got you know who had what we now call gender affirming surgeries were not I think their lives were not improved. Um, but he's a very controversial figure. He lied a lot about his research, um, and he did a lot of experiments on on kids and on intersex kids. The David Reimer case, right? The David Reimer case. Incredibly tragic case. Tragic, yeah. And I think actually both both of those twins, did they both end up killing themselves or they struggled? They both struggled with depression. Oh, they were twins. I forgot about that. Yeah, so just, they just were briefly twins. briefly give us the, the quick thumbnail sketch. On well, that. I want to say that I've been reading a book about John Money and I think he actually did facilitate lots of people um, successfully. So this is the most famous case, but... My, my understanding, and someone can call in and correct me if I'm wrong, is that he did often assign a gender identity to intersex people in ways that worked. It, um, so this famous case is didn't work, and he lied about it. But I, I think he, I think there were um, times when his theories, when he was able to prove his theories right. Um, but he, there was, there were twin boys and one had a botched circumcision. And because he'd been studying intersex people and what we called transsexuals, then he was like, oh, you can just, you know, gender identity is malleable. You can just raise this little boy as a girl. And, um, that did not work. And he was, you know, there are some behaviors that are much more typically male than female, like rough and tumble play, et cetera, 
so he was thought of as a as a tomboy, um, but it never, you know, he was lied to and he discovered what happened. And um, and this kid was given cross-sex hormones. I mean, so presumably they so. did a surgery early on to reconstruct his genitals and then, so. and then was given, yeah, we don't really know the details. I read, no, I read that, the book, I read the book uh, years and years ago. I just found it. It was just sitting on a block. I think it was called as nature made him. And what's interesting is now I'm reading this other book about John money and the author of this book, whose name I don't recall is, is, is saying that that book was not accurately reported. And, and this is the issue. <laughs> What does it mean to report accurately on this? How do we do it? It's so complicated. How do we do a good job? And I contend that the way to do a good job is to keep it messy and complicated and consult many different people with many different points of view and um, and just keep doing that for as long as we need to do that to get at either some, some kind of synthesis or acknowledging that synthesis is not possible. And how did you get into this line of inquiry? In um, actually, I first wrote something. Uh, you know, I had a gender nonconforming daughter, and by that I mean a female child who was drawn to the gender role of the opposite sex, who played with boys and girls equally, preferred what are culturally thought of as boys' clothes and boys' haircuts. And I was definitely confused and didn't understand it. And I, long before there were any battles in the media over trans kids, I wrote an essay for Parents Magazine. And that, and that was about struggling with sort of like wanting her to be exceptional, but wanting her to fit in and, um, and just all the things that her nonconformity brought up for me. And I think I even said in the essay, like she's, you know, communicates that she wants to be a boy, but that actually had not, ha- has never happened, but it was never edited. Parents magazine closed and they just put it up on the website and uh, with the title, my daughter wants to be a boy. This is also an ongoing problem of, I think writers really need to have some say in the headlines because it really, but no one said anything about it. It went up, the magazine closed. What year was this? Uh, like 2013, maybe. And then I didn't even think anything about it. And then as time went on, she can, we facilitated this. We did not, you know, discourage her. And, um, and then she, she went to school and someone said she was a tomboy. I feel like I can talk about this because this is all part, this is all out there. You know, I mean, whether or not I should have written any of this is worth debating another time, but I did. So I can talk about it. Anyway, she was called a tomboy at school. She came back and told us that's what she was. I was like, wait, what happened to that word? What happened to those kids? Oh yes. Right. We all looked like her when I was a kid. We all had short hair and we all wore boys clothes. And in the seventies, how how old were you by the way? Or when did you grow up generally? Uh, I grew up in the seventies and I'm approaching a very large birthday. Uh, so, um, yeah. So, so tomboys were like, you know, super popular. So this started me on an exploration and then, and then there were adults, you know, her doctor, people at the school that were essentially trying to facilitate a social transition that kept saying, do you want to change in the boys locker room? Would you like a new pronoun? And at first I thought like, Oh, that's so sweet. And then when it kept going, right. When she said, no, nah, that's fine. I don't, we're cool. Um, that's when I that's when I started to wonder why are we assuming that a child who doesn't conform to gender stereotypes can't be a member of that sex. And that's when I started on this exploration. I wrote an article for the New York Times. It was also a very, very nuanced op-ed with a very didactic headline slapped on it. Cause I think the headline was my daughter is not transgender. She's a tomboy. And I never called her a tomboy. And who knows how my kid is going to identify, which I said in the piece. But um, and then there was just enormous backlash and threats. And I just I had never experienced that. And after I recovered from it, I decided to write a book about it. So that's how I ended up here. What year did you write the New York Times piece? I don't mean to belabor the years, but I do think it's important uh, when it comes to this subject. Right. Because one of the things that 
that's important is that when I wrote something in 2013, no one batted an eyelash. And when I wrote something in 2017, there was enormous backlash. A lot happened between 2013 and 2017. So, I mean, it's interesting because you were aware enough of a cultural shift to to write the piece and talk about the dynamics that were playing out for your child, um, but you were also surprised by the response. So, would mm-hmm. you say that this was sort of the beginnings of the of the of the tipping point when it came to how the media was sort of responding? to the issue? Yeah, I think that this is what I think is interesting. So there was a huge response to that. And I'd written hundreds of articles and- In your never, life, not about, in my about life. this issue. Yeah. No, no. Now I've written a lot of issue, right. articles about gender, right. but no, before that I had written, our, I had already written hundreds of articles. I mean, some of them were about concrete slab foundations, you know, for I, I had, I started from the bottom. Well, you got to watch out for the concrete slab foundation (laughs) Twitter activist community. I I really, (laughs) that was one of my earliest articles. Um, So I, you know, I started out just writing anything I could get, learning how to do this and then kind of worked my way occasionally into the pages of the New York times occasionally. And, um, what I think is interesting is that there was enormous response and, to this um, article, a lot of it very positive, but also a, a lot of it incredibly ferociously negative. And I, that's also when I noticed that you would get private, you know, if someone wanted to commend you, they would write you an email. But if someone wanted to condemn you, they would do it on Twitter. But I also think at that time you could, in 2017, you could object to this narrative and you could say, you know, oh, I support this lady, you know, not transitioning her child. I mean, there was no reason to transition my child. My child did not ask for that, but, and I sympathize with the people whose children do. I, it's, I admittedly, I don't currently know what that is like, and I have not experienced a child with gender dysphoria. And it's important for me to acknowledge that. And I may still, you know, either one of my children, any, there are so many children with no history of gender nonconformity having gender dysphoria, you know, at or after puberty that obviously can, this can happen to anyone. So, but, but again, I just think that people could say, oh, I like this. This makes sense. And in fact, I do remember um, that a woman who worked at Glisten, you know, what I knew that? socially – Glisten is the gay and lesbian school something network. Um, I think it's an organization that advocates for LGBTQ kids in schools. Okay. And I socially knew someone very high up there, a butch woman. Um, and she, you know, put the article up and said, like, I relate to this and this makes sense to me. And I, I, I absolutely don't think that would happen today. And I also don't think the Times would print this op-ed today. And also some companies that like some super feminist companies or lesbian owned companies put it up. And they also got a lot of heat and backlash. And, and that I know one company whose name I will not say ended up, the backlash was also so severe that they really mar- started marketing their wares in a very different way as, you know, as for everybody, which is not at you know, that's an important thing to, to talk about too, about, you know, like this was a be, retail company. What? Yeah. What mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. A clothing company, um, that had supported my piece and then that was not acceptable. But I, I think, um, the more, the more controversial it was, the more the times kept promoting it. And I was, I had my head under the blankets. I, I did not being called a transphobe was very upsetting for me because I did not think of myself that way. And, you know, I'm like a lefty and I did not think what I had said, which was I support trans kids, but I don't think we should assume that kids who don't conform to gender norms can't be, you know, the biological category that they were born in. Um, I did not, I absolutely did not think that it would result in like being threatened or people trying to ruin my reputation or writing articles about me or going through, you know, everything I'd written before to prove me wrong. 
And these were um, trans activists. These are trans people on Twitter. Like when you say people, yeah. who do you mean? Yeah, I guess so. You know, news, uh, some gay news outlets that, that wrote articles, you know, with my name and the headline. I just hadn't had that happen before. And I, I was, I did not enjoy that at all. I think some people's reaction to that is be, is, is to be energized by it. And I was enervated by it and frightened. Well, but it's also not representative of what you think. I mean, that's what's most disturbing. It's just sort of willful misconstrual of one's message. Yeah. Yeah. And also that like, I brought up a good point. It was just a good point. It's a point worth considering, you know, as we, as our understandings of gender change and the way we're teaching about gender and teaching kids to talk and think about it. Let's not forget to talk about gender stereotypes and let's not to talk, forget to talk about gender nonconformity and the, you know, its connection to sexuality and sometimes and how hard it is to forecast who someone is going to be or how they're going to identify from what they're doing as a little kid. And, um, you know, I ended up writing a book about tomboys and talking about how whatever you, you know, people are always hating on the word, but the category was really liberating for kids because they could act like that and people understood what it was and they weren't like, Oh, do you need, do you need to say you're not a girl? Do you need, you know, puberty blockers? Do you need to change your name? You know, right. they were just like, oh, yeah, OK, we know what that is. Kind of. Like well, it was the- liberating for girls. There wasn't it- a sort of analog for boys. Nope, never has been. And yeah, you know, I think we're I think we used to uh, look at a very feminine boy and say, oh, that's probably that kid's probably gay and bully that kid. And now we look at that kid and say, oh, that's a trans kid or a non-binary kid. And um, and maybe that helps. I mean, I think it I, I think categorization is is humanly necessary and brings psychological relief. And that's why we put things in categories. So again, for people who are not just totally in the weeds, um, you know, when it comes to the subject, and by that, I mean, obsessing about every detail, (laughs) what exactly happened? How did this sort of gain momentum? Because it seems like all of a sudden, starting around 2000, yeah, 16, 17, all of these kids were identifying as trans. You started to hear these conversations. Oh my gosh, all of a sudden there are five kids in my daughter's seventh grade class who are saying that they're that they're transgender, maybe even non-binary. Like what happened in the culture that kind of turned this into a thing that then this, that then the institutions began responding to, because now you have, you know, school boards who are, uh, you know, saying that teachers don't necessarily have to tell parents that their kids are identifying with different pronouns. uh, If the kid wants to keep it just in the classroom, that this sort of thing, how did we get to this point? I guess is my question. Well, I want to go back to the media thing just for a second, because that's my interest. And because I think it's related to that, because I just want to say, I think several other things happen that are mirrored in the culture. One is Jesse singles piece, which I really should have looked up, but I actually think, I think was the year after mine. They had the same thing. So much backlash that the Atlantic just, you know, they, they ended up printing however many op-eds and essays by people saying, you know, this isn't how you should think about it. And then Jesse getting on, you know, like right. Glad has its like list of media enemies or yeah. something. This was in August of 2018. Was okay, so well, okay, great. Piece in the Atlantic, when children say they're trans, and it was a pretty straight down the middle reported piece about yeah. how parents should proceed in the most responsible, compassionate, informed way if their child says they're trans. And he did talk to people who had detransitioned as well as yeah. kids who had successfully transitioned. So I think that's when we went from like a piece like mine where the Times was kept promoting it, let me get more clicks, to, oh, we can't, we got this all wrong and we have to appease, people are so mad, we have to appease them. And I think what happened to the media is the same thing that happened to me, is the same thing that happened to these institutions. You know, I went out, I went out and talked to people like Chase Strangio, who had written a viral piece um, arguing against mine. And who is and Chase Strangio? Chase Strangio is the a lawyer who covers LGBTQ rights at the ACLU and who has 
you know, quite famously advocated for censorship and, you know, banning Abigail Schreier's book. And Abigail um, Schreier is the author of a book called Irreversible Damage, which yeah. was uh, hugely uh, polarizing and has kind of become a touchstone in uh, parts yeah. of this discussion. And I, I have not read the book, but I, but I did end up interviewing as I, as I tried to research a story that I pitched in the New York Times Magazine um, the summer, which they turned down, uh, about about our changing understandings of gender dysphoria and about these kids caught up in that. I ended up talking to a lot of the same people. So you know, these are mostly left wing liberal parents. Um, with the kids you've heard about, I mean, there are a lot of boys too. It's not just girls, but kids who are probably on the spectrum, kids who are gifted, kids who are awkward and quirky, and um, some have depression, some have eating disorders. So it's a very different population than the population that was originally studied, which were the kids who come out very early, who are gender nonconforming very early and think they're in the wrong body and are watched over periods of time, which is what most of the research is about. So, you know, anyway, I, th I think what happened is the backlash, I think what happened to all of us, to all of these institutions and individuals is that the backlash was so intense that it made us think, oh, we must be getting it wrong. And it happened, you know, at the same time that Trump rose to power and the whole country was even more polarized or whatever dormant kind of hatred different sides had for each other was, you know, lit a fire uh, by his rise. And, um, and so all of these, all of these people also felt, I think the mission of the media changed from reporting truth or multiple truths or opposing truths to, um, protecting marginalized groups. And it became about social justice and not about journalism. I think there are, and, and then, you know, social media and echo chambers, I think so many things happened and that resulted in many of us either truly believing it and truly believing the mission and that we're saving lives by affirming kids without question and that it was very important not to question anything about this because it would cause harm. And that word harm gets thrown around a lot to trans people. And the narrative was a, they're the most vulnerable people in the world. And B, you know, if you don't do everything they say exactly as they wanted, that they'll kill themselves. And that's not what the research says, though. I have talked to plenty of parents whose kids were suicidal, um, who are in this new, this cohort we're talking about, the, the, you know, coming out at or around puberty with, with comorbidities, with other mental health issues. And it is very scary for those parents, but many of them have also been coached to say that. And the worst part, I think, is that I've heard from many people from parents and from children who have desisted, that is, thought they were trans and then realized they weren't, or from detransitioners who also thought they were trans and realized they weren't, but after permanently altering their bodies. And I've heard from many people that doctors and therapists told them or told their parents in front of them that, you know, they would kill themselves if they didn't do it and if they didn't do it right away. And I think, you know... <laughs> That's I extraordinary. Heard the, it's I extraordinary. Mean, in, the context is, oh, we have – like, I'm here to tell you that this is your diagnosis and, and what we know, what I know from, you know, past patients is that you're likely to kill yourself if you don't do this. Sort of like if you don't get this surgery, you will die, like, you know, mm -hmm. because you have a heart condition. I mean, is that the sort of tone that is yeah. taken? Yeah, I think people believe that the research does show this, even though – I'm not, I'm not great at reading these studies, but, you know, there is no causation in these studies. There's correlation. Well, Laura Edwards Leaper concurs. She says there yeah. is the data does not, that's not born yeah. with, with the data. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's not, I don't think the, if you really go through all the research and you notice like, oh, most of it's about these, you know, lifelong conformers and, and the, some of the research is, you know, Jack Turbin's uh, oft-cited study about puberty blockers and connection. And who is Jack Turbin? Health. 
Well, I mean, I brought him, <laughs> I brought him up on another podcast, and I, I don't. Again, I don't want to make an enemy of him, but he's a psychiatrist. I reached out to him. I reached out to him oh, to yeah, come on no, the podcast, and I didn't get a response. Gonna, so he's not going to talk to you. But you, you, sh- you should. You should go through the media people at Stanford. I tried to interview him for a story, and then I sent follow-up questions about detransitioners, et cetera, and he declined to talk to me again. And he, and he, I don't. Yeah, so I'm who not is sure. I'm not sure anyone has ever, um, in a professional like I'm interviewing you for a story matter. I'm not sure anyone has ever treated me the way he treated me because I said I feel really confused about this research, and he was very like bullying and why don't you see it? And it's so clear. And I just said, as I keep saying, I don't think anything about this is clear. Anything about it, and I think it's very frightening when someone who is supposedly a scientist and a medical professional, um, and caring about vulnerable people. And I will say these, I do think these teens are vulnerable, but not necessarily because they're trans, but because they're having a lot of mental health problems. And because many of them are being coached or or, uh, online and, it's a tough. Well, tell us who life. he is. What is? What, oh, sorry. He yeah. he's a doctor. I think he's at Stanford, and he's published some of the most cited studies, like about puberty blockers and mental health. That then, if you look at the comments on the studies, there are just people saying like this methodology does not, you know, is not foolproof, and you know, this is not what what the research actually says. And people argue with him, but he's just gone. He's become the go to person. And I used to write to the. You know, there's a show in New York City called On the Media, a public radio show. And I kept yes. sending the hosts, begging them to cover this. And when they finally did, they had Jack Turbin on. And what I found was, um, oh, okay, here's this guy, Jack Turbin. And he's, I guess he's the go-to guy to talk about trans kids. And then I was interviewing people who had actually worked with trans kids, which, you know, he doesn't actually really work with that population. And those people would say, I'm not going to be in your in your article if he's in it. I'm not having, I will not be associated with him in any way. And these are people who are 100% supportive of, of gender affirming care and believe, you know, that transition can work for young children and, and adolescents and, you know, 0% transphobes. Um, but they really, really, really thought he was dangerous yeah. And he's the guy, he's like the media guy and right. we're all, you know, and, and he's a bully. I mean, a, a prominent, mm-hmm. a prominent researcher and figure at Stanford. Oh, his pedigree is, is Harvard, Yale, Stanford. And it's all, it's all from this work, but his, but the research doesn't really hold up. And that's the other thing, right? I'm just talking about, you, you'll just see the media just, they're interviewing him. He's got op-eds in the Times and CNN and people writing about this you know, in Vox or places like that. And they refer to his research and they don't, they don't know that people within experts within the field are very wary of him. I mean, beyond wary, really think he's dangerous. And, um, but those people won't speak up. They either, they either won't speak up or, you know, I mean, Laura Edwards Leeper is speaking up and she's speaking up to say, right. That the, the research doesn't support the approach that we are taking to children and teens with gender dysphoria right now. And so people like that, if you're going to give a platform to Jack Turbin, you need to give platforms also to the people who have a different point of view. I'm not saying give a point of view to people who say like, no trans people are real and everyone has to behave according to the rules of their sex. I'm not saying you need to platform that. But I am saying that within this field, there is dissent. And the media is not giving space or time or voice to that dissent. Well, I think too, one of the things that's happening, and I've talked about this with other guests, Dan Savage, for instance, is that there's so much fear about repeating what happened with gay people, 30 years ago, there was gay conversion therapy. There was, uh, you know, a feeling in many corners that this was not legitimate, that it was a gay lifestyle, that being homosexual Mm -hmm. was not an innate, immutable characteristic, that it was a choice. And obviously there was a lot of damage done that was wrong. There was conversion therapy that was really harmful. So I think that there's a lot of anxiety about repeating that. And it's so hard to know, like, 
you know, why is it that, you know, we were able to say, wow, a lot of people really are gay, you know, not as many as perhaps, you know, I think in the in the thick of it, I think a lot of, you know, gay people were saying, oh, we're one out of five people are gay, or for a while, it was one out of 10, right? I think there was a magazine called 10%. There was um, hmm. uh, a, a gay and lesbian magazine in the 90s, it was called 10%. So that referred to what was considered to be um, the the amount of gay people in the population, which seemed right to me at the time. I mean, I was living in New York City, but um, you know, it turns out that uh, you—it's not really analogous. This conversation is not really analogous to the conversation about gay people, at least in the terms that we think we're having it, because we're saying that we don't nece- that that people don't necessarily know who they are young people anyway. And I don't think we would say that about kids who are saying they're gay. I'm not articulating this very well, but I I know what, I know what, I know what you mean. It's very hard to combat the conversion therapy argument. It's very convincing. And it's, you know, when people say, well, doing exploratory therapy or trying to make you comfortable in your body is conversion therapy because it's trying to make you not transgender. And one of the things that I think is so interesting to explore, and I, and I'd hope, I hope my, I, I hope my book after the book I'm writing right now is, is about this, um, about like who gets to decide what's normal and where these ideas of normal come from. And one of the arguments from kind of some, some wings of the trans community is that they're saying there's one way to be better, that it's better to be cis than trans. And, you know, I think that was, we came to accept many of us, obviously that homophobia is alive and well, but, you know, people like you and me would agree it's not better to be gay or straight. And it, that's fine. So if we were approaching- well, I think we would say it's harder to be gay than straight. Yes, but in, you wouldn't dissuade, you wouldn't dissuade someone from trying to be gay because it was harder. You would try to change the world to be more accommodating and you would try to, if you had a child who was gay, you would try to raise that child to be resilient and aware of the realities of the world. And when you, when you use that same framework, it's very interesting. Like what if it was no better to be one way or another? What would we do? We'd transition anyone physically. Well, the physical transition is different, right? Because especially with children, because it's a very intense, hard thing to do to your body, but at least social transition. And there are, there are many, many parents who, you know, are like anything is fine and you can be anything you want and will facilitate you no matter what, and are not attached to these rigid ideas of the biological categories of male and female. And, um, and to them, it is no big deal. And that really is happening in our culture. But it's very, very different because A, it's asking everybody to think and talk differently. It's asking everybody to give up on bio- a kind of biological reality about what males and females are. It's compelling everyone to speak in a certain way. And it's also like often leading to medicalization that is very, very serious and the long term effects of suppressing your natural puberty and going through an artificial puberty really aren't known. And the other thing that I think is difficult about it is like, if you're going to say it's, it's totally fine to be gay, straight, bi, pan, anything is fine. That doesn't require any kind of changes. You don't have to change your name. And, and of course, names have no sex, right? So there is no name that is a boy's name or a girl's name. That's entirely cultural. So when you change your name because you have, you know, a certain identity, you end up reifying, you know, the, these cultural constructions and sort of making them into hard truths. And, you know, when you're like, I can't wear those clothes because those are girls clothes and boys clothes. And, then you're, then you're reinforcing these stereotypes. And I've done so much research about where our ideas of boys' clothes and girls' clothes come from. And they, they, they actually come mostly from homophobia and, and from changing understandings of sex, gender, and sexuality. So you end up having to change your name and the way you look and the way people trying to control how people refer to you when you're not there. And 
it's really so much more than I just want to be me. It's I want you to arrange everything differently so that I can be the me I think I am. It's very, very different. And the other thing is that it's really too bad that trying to get someone to feel comfortable in their body is thought of as conversion therapy because um, especially for the girls, it's so hard to feel comfortable in your body. And I do not feel comfortable in my body and never have. I've been so ashamed of myself my whole life. I've never wanted to cut my breasts off, but I would have leapt at the chance to change them <laughs> from a very young age. And um, so I just, I just think that, you know, they, they, I think they aren't comparable because one is about behavior and the other is about identity, language, and medicine. What I have heard from interviewing parents and detransitioners and desisters, young, young people, um, is that they are often... Um, you know, having other problems, like I said, you know, they're depressed, they have depression. Sometimes they've gone through a trauma, like a divorce or sexual abuse. Sometimes they're, they're gender nonconforming and assuming that, um, sometimes they're gay and they're assuming that their gender nonconformity must be about, um, gender and it, it isn't about sexuality. Um, and sometimes there are very, very serious things going on. So, I'm trying to think of what I have permission to talk about from who I've interviewed. But but what what I'll, I'll what I'll say is that I have heard of people, you know, being hospitalized, let's say for certain problems and then saying that they feel uncomfortable in their body or they think maybe they're trans and and 20 minutes later the doctor is um insisting that the kid get hormones right away. Um and, a hospital setting, mm -hmm, and that's like not a gender setting. clinic. A hospital, no, not a not a gender clinic. Like a psychiatric hospital. I mean, what not kind of doctor is making this assessment? Is it not a doctor a that knows no. anything about gender? No, it's medicine? not a doctor that knows anything about gender dysphoria and the social. None of the people are experts in it, but because the American Academy of Pediatrics is is. Tell, is also telling people to think about it this way and to affirm, affirm everyone without question. You know, this is these people. I I think they're I'm I'm I think they're doing it because they think it's the right thing to do. Um, someone I'm very close to. This is quite tragic for me. I mean, sad for me is 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 seeing more. Um, she's a pediatric um, emergency doctor, and she said she's seeing more dysphoric teenagers in the emergency room. And I just have said, when in, in your, the history of your career have you treated suicidality with, with cross-sex hormones, you know? Um, but I think they just, I think people think they're doing the right thing because that, because that is the message. And that is the message from adults who feel like they did know from an early age and it was so hard for them to transition and it was humiliating and grueling. The gatekeeping was horrible for them and they want to spare children. That's one wing. There's also the wing of, I'm just trying to amass power by shutting people up and not letting people dissent or ask questions. Well, and are but, those like people on, on Tumblr or on Twitter or who do you mean by that? Amassing um, power. I think there. I think there's a lot up. of cross. I think there's. A, I think a lot of people are both. I mean, I think the the people at these advocacy organizations are both getting tremendous power and funding, and also really have. I, I mean, they must. They must believe themselves. But even though, um, are most of them it, trans? I don't think so. I think some of them are. I don't think they're all. I mean, these are, these used to be mostly gay organizations and the ACLU used to, right. you know, I, I mean, it used to have a, used to care about women's rights also, which it, it doesn't now. So, you know, I just think, I, I think it's a whole giant mess and I think that's okay, but pretending that it's not a mess is doing us all a disservice. So the other thing that's happening is it's being, and Laura may have talked about this, removed from the sphere of therapists who should examine the kid and then advise the doctors what to do. And it's being seen as a, a medical issue. So, right. you know, oh, you have gender dysphoria. Well, 
oh, let me look it up. Oh, the way you treat gender dysphoria is with cross-sex hormones and sometimes surgeries. And you don't, you don't treat liver cancer with therapy. So why would you treat this medical problem with therapy? Uh, and the reason is because not all kids are good candidates for the medicine. Probably most of them aren't, I think, of the, these days. I mean, this, of this adolescent population, this population that, you know, wasn't seen much until recently. That's why. That's why we evaluate. And no, who would want to, there's no test for it. There's no clear test. Right now, the test is, do you meet the, the criteria for gender dysphoria? Okay. But does that mean it's going to last forever? You know, does that? Right. Well, <laughs> does also, that mean- I mean, Laura yeah. also pointed out in my conversation with her that a lot of these therapists are not trained to work with young people. They are right. assuming that they are, you know, dealing with adults because a lot of these kids come in and they're very mature. I mean, they're highly intelligent anyway for their age. And mm-hmm. as she said, you're not getting down and playing with them on the floor. You're speaking mm-hmm. with them as if you're speaking to an equal. And mm-hmm. so a lot of these clinicians kind of forget that the person they're dealing with is is younger, not literally because they know how old they are, but it's just, there isn't, is it the case that there is not a sort of specialty or subfield in um, adole- dealing with adolescents and young people who have gender dysphoria. I mean, obviously it's emerging, but it's not necessarily available in every community. Well, I think there are all kinds of ways to get some kind of certificate that says you're a gender therapist and you could be getting it from a place that, you know, subscribes to this very particular ideology. And so you're not necessarily getting trained in adolescent development, you don't, you, you don't necessarily know how gender identity develops, you know, in the first kind of eight years. And the, the, there's all kinds of stuff that happens in the beginning when kids don't know the difference between sex and sex stereotypes. So mm-hmm. you might, you might not have, you, you could be a gender therapist, but that doesn't mean anything. I thought it was so interesting when there was a group, I think it's called the, uh, something like the International Transgender Education center or something like that. And they did a workshop on detransition that was hosted by a trans woman. And she was absolutely, she lost some of her board positions and other things for doing this workshop. But I was like, I'm going to go check this workshop out. And it was filled with therapists and doctors. And she did a very thorough job reporting on it. And she, um, and she talked about, you know, detransition is not just, you know, um, that I wasn't transgender. Sometimes it's, I can't, I can't afford it. I can't access the medicine. It's too hard a life, right? There are lots of reasons, but there is this cohort that the media feels they must ignore um, of people who radically altered their bodies and then realized, oh, I was, you know, I had depression or I had other problems and I should not have done that. And I've, you know, I mean, I don't think they've, I've talked to quite a few of them and they actually have gone to this kind of Zen place where they're like, I did this and I cannot undo it. And I'm learning to make peace with my body. And it's so sad that they couldn't get there before or that you can't try to get people there because it's conversion therapy, (laughs) because that's where we all want to be. But bring me back to what I was talking about. Cause I, well, I mean, in terms of who's providing, um, these, these medications, these hormones, for instance. So Jolene and Marie, the, the moms that I spoke with, last summer and now they've the audience has just heard them speak with Laura this week um they one of them talked about how her her child her son went to see an OBGYN um i guess he was over 18 i'm saying mm-hmm. he that's the pronouns they use uh yeah. i think they just okay just for clarity so yeah i mean her child went know. to see an OBGYN yeah it's kind of weird to say her son went to see an OBGYN um uh-huh. and yeah. this doctor prescribed cross-sex hormones Uh and it seems it seems a little unbelievable but is that have you heard of that kind of thing oh yeah oh yeah you can that's informed consent model and that's the model we use for adults and that person is legally an adult and you can go to Planned Parenthood um, and there are I mean, I'm just working on a piece now about kind of comparing the way we think many on the left think about abortion and think about trans kids, where there are many people who 
you know, do not want there to be laws that require parents to give consent for abortion because they know that some parents will not give that consent and force the kid to have a baby. And there's a kind of, you know, pulling that argument and saying, yeah. you know, par- if, if parents are standing in the way, it's because they're transphobic. And, um, and so we should allow, you know, children know who they are and we should allow them to do it when it's really mostly that the parents know that this medication is very serious and they don't want their child to be unnecessarily medicated in a way that, you know, it's not like it makes your headache feel better. You know, it permanently right. alters your body and, it, and no one knows what the real long-term effects are. So right. yeah, I think it's, I think for some people, it's incredibly hard to access this medication and it's banned in Arkansas and, um, and other states are trying to ban it. And it's also very hard you know, what the media didn't report on is it was banned in England and then that was overturned. Um, but it's, you know, Finland and Sweden and parts of Australia, there are lots of places that are pulling back or banning um, these medications for minors because of detransitioners and because of the pressure to affirm without question. And they're not politically motivated. They're coming from within the mental health and medical communities. And that should be reported on everywhere here. But I think because it doesn't slot into the zeitgeist, the media just ignores it because, I mean, we're just not, we're refusing to take in information that interrupts that argument. So yeah, kids are, you know, in some places it's very hard to get this medication and in other places it's too easy. And okay. it's too, and again, it's too easy because the adults who look back and think, oh, I always knew this, even though we know not to put too much stock in retrospective studies or experiences, but, you know, adults are saying my life would have been easier if I could have done this younger, you know, for males, if I could have transitioned earlier, I would pass and um, yeah. that would have made my life easier, but yeah. that's worth that's again, you know, I go back to, are we making room for gender nonconformity? If you have a genuinely gender nonconforming human on your, on, you know, in your household, how do you just make space for that person to exist? How do you make space in the culture and how do you raise them to feel like I'm, I am perfect as I am. And what's wrong with that? What's wrong well, with teaching that's them? To hard for, that? That's hard for all of us. I mean, I, I've said this before. I can imagine how excruciating it must be to really feel like you are trans and knowing that you're about to enter puberty and that your body mm-hmm. is going to do something that you really don't want it to do. And if you're prevented mm-hmm. from, from having any control over that, it must be hell. I, I can, I can imagine a little bit of what that must be like. So it's so, but it's, it's just, but it's like important then it's important then to ask, Oh, well, why? What scares you about it, right? And I think that's what Laura would do. Well, tell me, tell me what it is specifically that you're frightened of. Are you? And then you might get to the point if you do that where you think like, oh, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I don't want men to leer at me, or um, I don't like the role associated with being a man, or, or you might be like, no, I hate my body. I cannot have this body, and it's worth it to me. I'm old enough to understand what I'm giving up um, in order to change my body. But how old do you have to be to understand that? I mean, I really caution against this narrative that trans people, as we understand them today, have always existed. Kind of like I said before, gender nonconforming people have always existed. They're in every culture, really. And, um, the concept of gender identity is so new that we cannot look back and say, oh, those, those women dressing as men during the civil war were trans or, you know, we just, I had some students, I had some students, some graduate students tell me that uh, David Bowie and Patti Smith were trans yeah, and that they, they just, if they had had the opportunity to, to, um, you know, be trans, at that time, they would have. Now, I laughed you at the time, Patty but now Smith. that I think of it, she's yeah, alive. I mean, if they were, but uh, I mean, if if Patty Smith were twenty years old today, or if she were Ellen Page, if Ellen mm-hmm. Page was Ellen Page back in the seventies, 
she would not have been trans is my guess. She would have been more like Patti Smith. If Patti Smith were Ellen Page now, maybe she would be transitioning. I mean, I think my point is there is no way to tell and we should not be imposing our current understanding of sex, gender and sexuality onto the past because in the West, I don't know that much about non-Western cultures, but in the West, those three things were all balled up together, you know, until the beginning of the 20th century. So you weren't, you were a boy and it meant you acted a certain way and that was your body and it meant you were attracted to a certain kind of person. And once we separated out sexuality from that, as the field of sexology rose um, at the end of the 19th century, then we were like, oh, you can be a man, but be attracted to another man. Obviously, the behavior was happening, but the idea of that as a discrete category of person, that was a new idea in the West. And gender wasn't really quite part separated out from that. And by gender, I mean the idea of how masculine or feminine you are. Not, it wasn't really separated out. And that is why we started, kids used to have this kind of gender neutral childhood um, where they all wore dresses and they all had long hair until they went to school. And, you know, they were, they were all essentially in the same, what we came to think of as feminine clothing. And it was only when we had an understanding of the discrete category of homosexual that we decided, oh, we have to raise boys to be men. So we have to raise them to be masculine. So we have to put them, dress them like little men and we have to put balls and bears on their shirts. And we have to like, you know, colors weren't part of this yet because colors were not, you know, took a while to be able to produce. And it it all happens as there's more industrialization and clothing is mass produced, all this stuff Again, you you have all these cultural changes that converge and change our understanding and our practices, you know, but it was much later that we started to have this idea of gender identity that came from John Money and his colleagues studying this trend, what we call the transsexual population. So it's, you know, there have always been gender nonconforming people, whether or not they would transition, how they would identify themselves. We don't know. And, and that isn't an academically sound thing to do to say, <laughs> you know, Mulan was not an oppressed woman. She was, I know she's not real, but, um, but you know, she's actually a liberated transgender man. That mm-hmm. is, happens a lot. And when you right. do that, then you don't talk about women's oppression. We can't, right. we can't know. We can't know. So we have to be comfortable with the fact that we, can't know. And we have to be more comfortable with this is a mess. And uh, there are a lot of people who have gained a lot of power and want to control the way we think about it. And we have to resist that. We have to think critically about it because it's very, very serious to medicate yourself that way. And I know it's not as serious for an adult who's already gone through puberty. Um, and, and then an adult can understand, again, what they're giving up. But, th- you know, to act like, you know, s- s- kids are, some kids are learning that, that which puberty they go through is optional. And I think we should be able to object to some of these ideas without being labeled hateful. Well, and before we wrap this up, I really want you to help me get a sense of how much of this is like a conspiracy Okay, because I talk to people a lot and it's sometimes people, they get emotional, they get kind of like freaked out and suddenly the conversation, it goes from like sort of the conversation we've been having into this sort of like, oh my gosh, um, you know, big pharma is behind this and, you know, you you don't even want to know and, you know, so-and-so, this tech company person who is like, you know, behind all these woke blogs is actually on the board of this medical organization. Mm-hmm. Like, what do you know about the kind of dimensions of that sort of thinking? The things you're hearing, it's a conspiracy from the uh, pharmaceutical companies or from a couple of, you know, really rich trans women or it's social contagion or it's um, people at these nonprofits that used to represent gay rights and now have, you know, given that up and they, you know, they're gaining power through representing trans rights. What I want to say very clearly is it's a, it's a lot of different things. 
always these zeitgeist changes are being pushed from many, many places. And as I said before, it's also that the institutions believe that they're doing the right thing. And we started this conversation. It was like, why is the backlash so great? And I wonder, is the backlash so great because it doesn't stand up to scrutiny? And I am asking us to scrutinize it, um, not because I want to keep trans people from transitioning, because I absolutely do not. I think like if that is what you need to do to end your suffering, I, as an adult, I am all for it. But I think we have to make sure that what's happening, that like the, and that this this these populations that are being facilitated into transition, we have to make sure that what's what we're doing stands up to scrutiny. If it does, then great, right? If it does, then oh my god, all these people objecting are wrong, and it's going great and wonderful. If it doesn't stand up to scrutiny, it doesn't mean that we can, we have to end this practice. It means we have we have to try a new tack and we have to incorporate the dissent. We have to incorporate the experience of detransitioners. We have to have thorough assessment that somehow doesn't feel like gatekeeping. That's what I was going to say. I remember before about when I went to the detransition workshop with this trans woman who was, you know, really paid a, a hefty price to hold it. And I thought nothing in this, if I was a clinician, would make me feel like I shouldn't transition kids. It would make me feel like, wow, I have a lot of power and I need to wield it very carefully and understand, you know, the difference between these populations and assess their needs carefully. And um, of any population, you know, so I don't think acknowledging the mess is going to make it so that trans people can't have the health care they need. I think suppressing the mess is going to backfire. And I think, I think that's what, you know, people like Laura Edwards Leeper believe. I think the people who want to speak out, but aren't um, cause they're, cause they want to keep their jobs because they don't want to be replaced by, you know, these other kind of activist clinicians I think that's what they believe too. That's that the suppression that's happening is ultimately going to be more dangerous for the people who would benefit from this treatment. Well, before I let you go, I just want to make sure you've said everything you want to say, at least in this interview, about gender nonconformity, because that's really what it seems like that's what you spend the most time thinking about. Like a lot of this conversation would be would be moot if we could just evolve our ideas about stereotypes and conformity. So do you imagine a future in which we would all be sort of non-binary for lack of a better word? Well, I like to imagine a future in which sex is de-emphasized in which people understand that this is just your body and you should take care of it and love it. And uh, how masculine or feminine you are, whatever you call yourself, um, that 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 is not connected to sex. And it it seems strange that I, people have to be reminded of that that sex and gender are not connected. And because gender now means gender identity to people and not gender stereotypes or norms, that's part of the problem. But when I say sex and gender aren't connected, what I mean is. You may ha you have a male or female body, or there are very few people. You know, we've really exaggerated this thing about you know, like one point seven percent of the population is intersex, and therefore the whole category gets thrown out the window. It's really just a few people have actual intersex conditions, like having ovo testes, where you are giving off both male and female hormones in your body to a to a certain extent. And um, you know, the best thing is this is your body and it doesn't determine how masculine or feminine you are. And however you are in the world is fine. And because we have gendered names and activities and colors and clothes, and, uh, you know, I think people feel so that they have to reject them if they have a certain identity. But I, you know, my activism, if, if I have any, is around liberating all of the 
all of the stuff that's been gendered so that kids can live the way these tomboys of the 70s lived, where they could access the girl stuff and the boy stuff if they wanted. And so I would prefer that we didn't have girl stuff and boy stuff more than I care about there not being girls and boys. And I think that the focus on identity is very confusing for a lot of young people. And um, I would prefer, you know, I talked about in the book that tomboys had before puberty, this protective bubble of ambiguity. And I would like to fold every child into that protective bubble where they do not have to declare anything about themselves and they don't have to change anything about themselves. Um, and they could feel comfortable exploring and, um, and however they end up, wherever they land is a good place. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for talking with me. This is incredibly complicated and, um, yeah. I think uh, what you're doing is really important because you recognize how complicated it is. So I really appreciate um, your taking all this time. As, as do you recognize how complicated it is. And thanks for l letting me be complicated um, because it's getting harder and harder to do that. Well, that's why we're all here. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That was my conversation with Lisa Selen Davis. She is a journalist and the author of Tomboy, The Surprising History and Future of Girls Who Dare to Be Different. She also writes a weekly Substack newsletter called Broadview about gender nonconformity and how it's covered in the media and handled by the medical establishment. You've been listening to The Unspeakable Podcast. To get ad-free versions of this show, as well as other perks, including full access to video interviews that are posted on the new Unspeakable YouTube channel, please support the show at patreon.com slash the unspeakable. There is a growing community of listeners there, including a group that meets regularly to discuss individual episodes. And I strongly suspect this series will be on the menu. To just learn about the show in general, its website is theunspeakablepodcast.com. That's where you can get unofficial Unspeakable Podcast nuanced AF merchandise, among lots of other things. That's it for now. It's been a long week. I'll be back next week with another super nuanced guest. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Hi, I'm Frank. I don't like change. And I just saw a billboard for this new BJ's Wholesale Club talking about up to 25% off grocery store prices. Oh, really? What's wrong with paying full price, huh? No, sir. I would not join BJ's Wholesale Club. Let's agree to disagree, Frank. Say you do want to sign up now for amazing savings. Join the new BJ's Wholesale Club, opening soon in South Fayette. Visit BJ's.com slash South Fayette or the BJ's Membership Center at Newbury Market. Are you in excruciating pain brought on by your son, daughter, or spouse suffering from addiction? The sleepless nights, the constant worry, and the feelings of isolation. Recovery Centers of America wants you to know you're not alone. Addiction destroys families. But if you call Recovery Centers of America today at 1-888-RECOVERY, your loved one can begin to recover, and so can your whole family. At Recovery Centers of America at Monroeville, your loved one will be treated with compassion and dignity by expert addiction professionals while recovering in a world-class facility. Family Support Services will give you knowledge, connection, and community so that you can begin to heal and recover as well. Call 1-888-RECOVERY today. Recovery Centers of America accepts insurance, provides transportation, and offers intervention services at no cost. Patients are admitted 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Call 1-888-RECOVERY now.